I am so pleased to be welcoming you to this class, Psych 1, Fast Track. And in this lecture, I'm going to be talking about two things. First, how to succeed in this class. And second, the first chapter on discovering psychology. So we will go over a little bit of content after I go through some hints and tips and advice for how to approach this class. And the first thing that I want to do is to talk to you about the fact that this is a fast track class. And there's an, I have designed it so there's a lot of work to do. You will learn so much about psychology, um, but you need to be aware that there are 18 assignments a week for the next eight weeks. You don't get any time off for Thanksgiving, Every week, you're going to listen to two half-hour lectures. You're going to read four chapters in your textbook and do some reading guides on them. You're going to write four uh, discussion post shares um, that may involve extra reading. You're going to ask four questions about each topic that you read. And you're going to take four quiz quizzes, each with 10 quiz questions. Now, sometimes I'll also assign you a reflection paper. There's one due at the end of our first week. And sometimes I'll also be asking you to respond to announcements. So I've kind of mapped it out. And there's no way you can really do this class without spending about eight hours a week. Um, and that's just the way it is. Uh, and so be aware of the amount of work as you go into this. Um, and I'm going to give you some more tips. First of all, you got to do this class, you need to use Canvas. And I want you to use some of the nicer features of Canvas. One of my favorite things is this to do list that on the home page of our um, course, this is actually another, another Psych One course that I just, I'm still teaching as we speak. But here's a nice to do list. You can always see what's due a lecture response, an ask is due, a quiz is due. And so if you monitor our homepage, it will give you a sense of what's up and what's what. You can also go into our modules page that tells you, that lays everything out in an organized way. Um, in general, you're going to want to use a laptop or a Chromebook or something to do your written assignments, the things that you have to type. But you can monitor what's due by checking into your phone book. I'm sorry, your phone um, or your smartphone. Um, so I want you to make sure that when you, in your account, your account, I want you to go into notifications and I want you to look at announcements for course activities. And I want you to make sure to suggest to choose the email that you want to be sent your course announcements to. Um, you can have it go to your Chafee email, and um, maybe you can even set up notifications to another email. I don't know that much about Canvas. But make sure that you have it checked that you receive announcements. Um, and there you have it. Also, I want, oh, I want you to also check to make sure that if you are, that you are notified when I comment on your um, submissions. So if I've made a comment on something you've submitted, I want you to be notified because I'd like you to go see it, go read it. I want you to be paying attention to when I'm giving you feedback. Um, another thing that's important is you're going to want to upload the correct file type. And in general, what works best is Microsoft Word. And what's nice is if you didn't know, Chafee has a deal where you can have Microsoft Word for free. I think you can also get other things like Excel or whatever, but you won't need them for my course. All you'll need is Microsoft Word. If you don't want to use that and say prefer to use Google Docs, you can save your Google Doc as a PDF and upload that. I want you to be able to see my feedback. So when I give you feedback, when I've graded something, you can go into your grades, click on grades, click on the assignment that's been graded, 
and it opens up a page that looks like this when you click on the assignment through grades. And, and here it says my comment is right here. I, so look here for my comment and you can reply to my comment here. If you need me to answer something, I want to hear from you in email. So my email address is all over the website, um, our Canvas site, and I would just like you to email me. Even I want to get more emails from students, and I'm trying to I'm trying to find this special way to get you to understand that I really want to hear from you. Even if it's a question about what did you mean when you said this or that, it, you you're going to want to get my attention by emailing me. Also, well, I'll tell you more about that later, but I'm going to talk to you about the textbook now. The textbook is not brand new. The drawback of it not being super new is it has like some old references to say old TV shows every now and then, just things that you may not particularly think is very happening. But the good thing is that there's lots of cheap copies out there. So we're using the 10th edition. I personally use um, my Kindle, a Kindle version. I like to have it on my laptop because one of the things I like to do from the textbook is I like to copy and paste to help me compile my notes. Um, and so that's one of the reasons why I like to use ebooks. And it's only $33, at least when I got this textbook. So we talked a little bit about the requirements for the course. And um, and this, is, this sets out all of the things that you're going to have to do and the points toward the final grade. So you're going to listen to this type of lecture twice a week. The reading guides, all of this is detailed in the syllabus and really, really clearly laid out in each module. Um, essentially, uh, these two, share and asks, they're all about posting on a discussion board. So you're going to be able to read each other's. Sometimes I respond to students on the discussion board. Sometimes I don't. I always read them. I always read them. One of the things I tend to respond to is when you, when I give a lecture, I'm going to ask you to write a response like, what, what did you take away from that lecture? I have found that when, when people tell me what they got out of what I said, I, it, it actually very fruitful. And I often find myself responding to these lecture responses. Sometimes I'll even go and find interesting articles or links from the web or interesting videos in response to people's questions that arise in this lecture response. So I've discovered that that's a really nice thing for us to do together. Um, and then quizzes are just quizzes, multiple choice, true and false. Um, three times in the next eight weeks, I will ref assign reflection papers. I give you an example on the first reflection paper so you can know sort of what I'm looking for. And each reflection paper has a rubric so you know what I'm grading for. One of the key things that I'm going to look for you to do in these reflection papers is just to follow the prompt to actually answer what I'm looking for. Another thing, I want you to use multiple paragraphs and grammar is important to me. I'm gonna share something about, I think I'll share it in an announcement. Um, like I did a video that shows you some things that I think about writing, punctuating, grammar. It's not that great of a video, but it'll give you insight into how I think. So I think I'll share it with you. And I wanna see you responding to other students' posts. Maybe you're just agreeing. Maybe you're being supportive. Maybe you are um, maybe you're challenging in a respectful way. All of that is, I'm hoping to see that happen. Because this is online and you don't get to sit next to someone in a class, the best thing that we have are these discussion boards. So I'm really hoping that you look to see what others are writing and find a way to respond to them. It actually goes toward your participation grade. Or to, I'm grading you at the end of the semester on the extent to which I see you do these things, the extent to which you acknowledge announcements, you respond to posts. And then I skip this one because I want you to do this in the next two weeks. I've scheduled three possible show your face moments. They're basically Zoom meetings. And I'd like you to show up. And I'd like to see your face. And I'd like to 
know your name and I'd like to just put you in my own mind so that when I'm grading your paper, I've got your face and, and, and you're real to me. And so I'm, you, I'm grading you on whether or not you do show me your face. So I've created three chances for you to show up on a Zoom meeting. And if you really, really, really can't make it because of um, work, uh, just let me know. I don't mind if you have kids in the background. That's a common thing in my classes. I really don't mind. We make it work. Totally fine. I'm a mother myself. I know how it is. Um, at the end of the semester, you'll write a final paper. There'll be an exam. And there's just one extra point that I'm going to, based on how, whether I've seen you interact either with other people or with me by sending me emails or responding to the announcements. I want you to respond to the announcements at least to say that you've got it by the kind, the quality of your responses to my lectures, like how thoughtful are you? I find that everybody's very thoughtful. Um, so um, this is just discretionary, like how consistent and um, positive and um, engaged was your participation in the class. I'm going to go through a couple of things that you can read more about each one of these things in the syllabus. Um, but I'm going to tell you something that I don't want to see. It's called plagiarism. Plagiarism means copying someone else's work and presenting it as your own, and it's an extremely serious violation of a scholar's code of conduct. Don't do this. Every Actually, the when I really step up how much uh, this could, you're, you could fail my class if I catch you doing this twice. The first time I catch you doing it, I'll give you a warning and I'll be so disappointed in you because it's just the worst to go to the web and copy a paragraph from Wikipedia and stick it in your paper as if you wrote it. Like that doesn't happen that often, but it just bothers me so much when I see it, that I need to make sure you don't do it. So the first offense is a zero for the assignment, a warning. The second offense, I'm going to fail you for my course. And I'm going to report you to the dean. Okay, so that's as negative as I hope to get in this whole uh, lecture. But you got to know, you need to write your own words. The only time when I say it's fine to copy and paste, and I say it explicitly, is in the reading guides. Because the reading guides is not you presenting your thoughts and your words. The reading guides is you collecting little bits of information from the chapter and, or whatever the reading assignment is and um, saving it for yourself. The reading guides are actually intended to be something like study guides. I want you to know about lateness. The good news in my class is the worst you c the most points I will take off for any assignment for being late is 50%. And often I don't even take that. I'm a little bit discretionary about my lateness. Also, if you contact me in advance and tell me, hey, I've got something big going on. And if you ask me for some forbearance and forgiveness, is a good chance that I won't even apply a late penalty. But it's up to me. I'll decide. Um, but you should know that just because you're late, don't make that a reason to not turn in your assignment because every assignment counts. This whole class is built on tons of little assignments that all add up. So if you're a little late, just send it on in, take a tiny hit, and it will help you get a good grade. I'm going to send you this video about grammar. Um, I want you to understand what grammar means to me. Grammar, following the grammar rules makes writing neat and easy to read. I want you to write well, because if you write well, it's going to help in every application letter you ever write. It's going to help you advance in your life and career. Um, I want to see you capitalize the I when referring to yourself. I just, when I see a lowercase I when you're referring to yourself, it's just, I'm sorry, but it strikes me as lazy. I'm sure it could happen by mistake once in a while, but boy, you're supposed to reread your papers that you send to me. 
reread your posts before you post them. I want to see you have some element of formality, especially in your reflection papers. I want your sentences to be complete and punctuated correctly with no random spaces or randomly capitalized words or, 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 or lack of capitalization at the beginning of the sentence. And if you don't understand the rules of grammar, I'm giving you a link to a free video series, and I'm also going to send you my little tips and tricks and notes about it as well. I'm looking for clarity and logic. Simple language to make straightforward points is all I'm looking for. I am not impressed by, well, no, if what I'm trying to say is sometimes people try to write in an overly fancy way. Not necessary for me. I like direct language that's maybe a step up in terms of just um, completeness and, and sentence structure from how you normally talk, but pretty close to how you normally talk because you're, I'm really looking for your logic. I'm looking for you to make a logical link from one thought to the next. So when you speak, you tend to speak logically. Usually one thought leads into the next thought. And I want you to think about your writing as having that flow. I'm definitely looking for separate paragraphs for distinct thoughts and I count off if you turn in a reflection paper with one paragraph in it. That's nothing. That doesn't show that you thought it about your structure at all. So I count off for that. Um, and I want you to structure the paragraph to follow the prompt. Every reflection paper that I um, assign, and sometimes shares too, there's a specific prompt. I'm looking for you to answer questions in a certain way. So I'm looking for that. And when I read your good writing, it makes me feel warm toward you. Uh, it makes me like you when I see good, clear, logical writing, and um, and you should know that. And let's uh, so let's um, the other good thing that you might be excited about is if you get all of your assignments in. Um, oh, oh, that's the next one. Let me tell you about this extra credit. Every now and then, I'll lob an extra credit opportunity in your way, and. Um, you can actually make more than 100 points in total, although I'm grading it on 100 points. So any extra credit that you do just goes straight into on top of your total grade total. And so the extra credits are available for a limited amount of time. And I just encourage you to do extra credits. That's another little tip is that I form good feelings about students who do extra credit. It sort of warms me. It's like, oh, Somebody is this into the class. They're so into the class that they're doing the extra credit. So, um, and then the last thing is if you get all the great required graded activities submitted, even if they're late, I will give you three bonus points on top of your grade. So if you got like a B plus and you did, you submitted all of the assigned um, assignments, that would bump you to an A minus, right? That's pretty good. So um, there's a, this is a big incentive for you to do all of the assignments. And you will find that the assignments that I give you, they're not crazy. They're very enjoyable in and of themselves, usually, at least moderately enjoyable. Um, and I just hope that you do them all because if you do all of these assignments, you are going to learn so much in this class. And this class is filled with great content. The last thing I'm going to say before we start go into a little bit about uh, what psychology is, I want you to email me. It's not just about asking for help. It's also about sharing your thoughts. So sometimes, here's a little note I wrote, sometimes students email me just to share their thoughts. Just because something happened in their lives and it reminded them of what they're learning in, in our course and they send me a little note. And I want you to know that that type of thing, it makes my day. You know, I, I, um, because I can't look at your faces, the next best thing is to hear a little bit about your lives. And, um, 
And I would love it if you just reached, if you had a thought and wanted to share it with me. I totally invite you and want you to do that. So moving on, now we're going to talk about discovering psychology. And, you know, I'm just going to give you a sense of what these lectures are. So my lectures aren't the same as the kind of lecture you would get if you showed up into a college class in a classroom. Essentially, I'm treating them as previews because I'm talking about things that you will be reading about in the chapter. But I, what I want to do with the lectures is I want to give you a sense of what's important to me, what I think makes it make more sense or is something worth emphasizing. There's way more that goes on in each lecture than I can give you. In I'm sorry. There's way more that goes on in each chapter. There's so much information, and it's really interesting. These lectures are me pointing you in the direction of what is interesting and what you might want to look at and how you might want to think of it. So here we go. What is psychology? Here's a definition of psychology. Psychology is the systematic scientific study of behaviors and mental processes. Boom. I'm going to look at that in more detail. Psychology is the systematic scientific study of behaviors and mental processes. What do we mean by scientific? We're going to talk about this more when we get into research methods. But it means it's measurable, predictable, testable, replicable, and falsifiable. Science is a specific way of investigating reality. And it really depends on measuring something and repeating an experiment and making a prediction and seeing if it comes true. So when you say, oh, that's scientific, I want you to know that when we talk about something being scientific in psychology, we're talking about a very specific approach to how we gather evidence for things. The next thing, I want you to know the difference between behaviors and mental processes. In fact, I'm, pro I'm going to make sure that that's on the final. That a behavior is something that you can see. It is objectively observable. A mental process is something that goes on in your mind and you can't possibly see it. You, no one can know what it is. It's mental. It's happening in your mind. So let's say you, um, it's late at night and you hear somebody bumping around in the kitchen and you think it's a burglar. Okay. Now, if I clutch the blankets close to my chest, and, you know, then I'm clutching the blankets close to my chest. Now, you could say that looks like she's afraid, but the fear is a mental process. The fear is happening in my head. I'm just clutching a blanket. You could also say, oh my goodness, look at her heart beating. Well, her heart is beating in a way that is observable. You could actually measure how fast my heart is beating if you hook me up to some, some, some electrodes or whatever. So then you could actually say that heartbeat is a behavior because it's observable, objectively. But how I feel and what I think, I thought it was a burglar. Those are all mental processes because they're only happening in my mind. Got it? Good. All right. So we're going to go over the goals of psychology. And we're going to talk about... The four goals of psychology, I'm going to put them all here right now, and we're going to talk about it in the context of why, do you, why did young people go off on spring break in the middle of a pandemic when they could get a deadly disease? So the goals of psychology might approach this question by describing it, just telling it like it is. College students on spring break resisted the call for social distancing and partying in Mexico. That's just a description. It doesn't say why. It doesn't say anything. It just, that happened. Did that happen? That happened. Described it. The explanation 
the goal of explaining is why is it like that? Why would college students do that? Well, there's lots of theories in psychology that maybe we will get to talk about. For example, adolescents or young adults have an underdeveloped executive function in their brain. Their brains aren't done growing, so they make impulsive decisions. Or there may be mating rituals that are tied to the very fact of spring break, like they may be looking either for love or something else, and that might be what's causing them to do it. Or they may have an unlimited time perspective, and therefore death isn't real to them. So these are all sort of theories and ideas about that might explain this behavior that was described. The prediction goal, the goal of predicting, asks, will it be the same way next time? So this would predict that young adults will engage in risky behavior if the rewards are high enough. So this is taking a theory that young adults are seeking hedonic rewards and, and proposing that if the rewards are high enough, they will engage in risky behavior. Now you could make a prediction using any one of these theories, but the goal of psychology is to have an explanatory theory that hopefully we'll predict whether that happens in the future. And then the last goal of psychology, which is more controversial, is the goal of controlling. How can we make it go the way we want? So this way we would use psychology to potentially get young adults to comply with the recommendations to offer by offering an equally compelling reward. So like how can we get them to not go to Mexico? Mm, I really can't think of anything as equally compelling as partying uh, on a Mexican beach. But anyway, the, the goal would be that to, we may try to either give them a reward or punish them for not. But the, I, the, these goals of psychology um, sort of override, they're like an umbrella under which most actions of psychology take place. Now. You'll also be reading about modern approaches to psychology. And so I've given you my sort of shorthand way of thinking about each one of these goals. So the biological approach to psychology would suggest that my body made me do it. The cognitive approach suggests that my thought processes made me do it. It's all about how I'm thinking and that. The behavioral approach would suggest that the rewards and punishments that I experience make me do it. The psychodynamic approach suggests that the unconscious forces from my psyche, from back in my childhood, or my hidden drives, those made me do it. The humanistic approach to psychology suggests that my desire to be all I can be made me do it. My better angels are driving me toward my, um, my self-actualization. The sociocultural approach to psychology suggests that my context and my culture made me do it. And the evolutionary approach suggests that my animal nature made me do it. It's a little bit like biology, but it, but it thinks about in terms of how did we evolve to be the way that we are. So these are many uh, different modern approaches to psychology that you'll read about. I'll ask you to think about. Maybe some of these make more sense to you or call to you in different ways. But ultimately, modern psychologists understand that um, no one of these can explain all human behavior. And every one of these can explain different pieces of behavior in different ways. So even though sometimes they get set up as contradictory or opposing forces, these actually work very well together because they cover different aspects of human experience. Um, I'm going to suggest that you remember a few important names. Um, and I'm going to just let you consult the slides because I will make the slides available. But when you encounter each one of these different approaches, you're going to encounter some of these names. And part of being 
educated in psychology is being educated in some of the names of the people who made a big difference in psychology. And so I want to highlight that to you. So as you encounter the names, both in this first chapter and throughout the rest of the book, pay some attention to them and try to remember the most important ones. Early psychology, you'll read about that, where there is Wilhelm Wundt, who worked on measuring perception and reaction times. He's credited at having the first lab. He's credited at being sort of the first scientific approach to measuring what is going on in somebody's experience. How fast did they react to that cue? That was William Wundt. William James was an American, and he focused on the evolutionary adaptations of the mind. So inspired by Darwin, he, he looked at mental processes and said, why did we evolve, say, to need each other? Why did we evolve, say, to freeze or flee or fight when encountering danger? Um, and then Sigmund Freud is uh, also considered a founding father of the field. Very controversial founder because a lot of what he said is essential to our understanding of human life. And a lot of what he said is sort of baloney and, and, and honestly embarrassing to have to teach. But you'll see when we get to it. Um. Now, the last thing that we're going to talk about are careers in psychology. Um, I have some uh, extra credit. Well, I think I have you look at some things here in the share this week where you'll actually look to see what type of psychology you're most interested after you read about it. Me, personally, I'm in academic psychology. I do research. I do research on emotion. But there's also other interesting fields. For example, if you want to work in HR or if you want to start a business, you may be interested in organizational or industrial psychology. Um, this is measuring behavior, measuring experiences. So this could be a designer or somebody designing um, uh, user experience. There's health psychologists. We're going to talk about that right away when we, when we read stress. And developmental psychologists tend to work with children, but also adults and aging. Anything that happens at a specific time in life is something that a developmental psychologist work with. And then the thing that most of you are probably most aware of, and most of you think that we're going to be spending our time on, is clinical psychology. And what I can tell you, clinical psychology is essentially trying to help people who are having problems, right? Usually there's some psychological disorder. Maybe it could even be a relationship problem and say a family therapy kind of thing. But most of you think of psychology as clinical psychology. What you're going to find is we're not going to even talk about clinical psychology until the very end of this course. And we're going to go through all of these building blocks of understanding human experience and human behavior and mental processes and the many building blocks that have come to help us understand, um, uh, to know what we know, essentially. So this is, I'm so glad you're in this class. Uh, I'm just over my 30 minutes, so I'm going to uh, uh, wish you a fruitful, fun, engaging, satisfying course. And I'm looking forward to reading your work.